Good morning, everyone. We're glad morning. to have you here. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, and we're excited to be talking about free speech online, on campus. And we thought we'd start with Jeff talking a little bit about why James Madison, um, our, one of our founding fathers and um, key to the First Amendment, thought free speech was important to the survival of American democracy, because that really is fundamentally why we're having this conversation. Thank you so much. Julie, it's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you all for coming this morning. And yes, Madison thought that free speech and civil dialogue was central to the future of the American Republic. He thought that the entire system would collapse unless citizens were educated about the Constitution. And I was walking out last night, and I found Madison's essays in the National Gazette from 1791, where he is looking at new communications technologies, which he believes will inform the public about the Constitution and allow them to govern based on reason rather than passion. Throughout Madison's writings, you see his belief that the founders created not a direct democracy, but a representative republic that was supposed to promote reason, thoughtful deliberation over time. And he thought when people made quick decisions, they would uh, threaten liberty. And when deliberation took place over time and was informed, then it could serve the public good and private rights. So he sets up the system to create a republic which is large enough to avoid factions, which are special interest groups favoring one group rather than another, but is connected enough so that people can actually learn about the Constitution. So in this incredible essay called Public Opinion, he says new uh, innovations like roads, public improvements, and public newspapers that may inform citizens with facts can mitigate the dangers of a big republic and make sure that people are informed. And this will promote reason rather than passion. And this is why he says the Bill of Rights is so important, as a means of public education. He doesn't think it's going to be enforced by courts. He thinks that if citizens know the First Amendment and know their rights, then they won't threaten liberty because they'll adhere to these principles of free speech. So what we need to talk about today, Julie, is was Madison too optimistic? And in an age of social media, where students online are communicating fast and Twitter mobs can formulate quickly, is his whole hope that people will deliberate slowly, will respect free speech, and in particular will protect the thought that they hate too optimistic? And we can talk in a moment about the situation of hate speech on campus and online, but Madison is very keen that speech in America should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That's the final piece of the puzzle that he writes when the Adams administration tries to pass this law allowing the government to imprison its critics. Madison says in the Virginia resolutions that you need total freedom to insult government officials and to promote them, uh, to, to criticize them because that's the key to democracy. So that principle that even hateful speech is permissible unless it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence also comes from Madison. That's under siege. And my, my first question to you, Julie, uh, is what, was Madison too optimistic? Well, it's a great question. He didn't know about Twitter and other social media. But the notion that um, with facts, and with time to deliberate, we can find the common good seems to be quite a challenge for us right now. Especially when we think about college campuses, I think that there is a common sense, and we've had some recent surveys from the Brookings Institution, from Gallup, from Bucknell, that tell us that students are not as tolerant of free speech as we would hope, and that they're not as tolerant of various perspectives as we would hope. But remember, they are just reflecting the rest of society. So I think when we look at college students and call them snowflakes and say that they um, aren't ready to deal with different perspectives, they are no different than older adults in our society, than the rest of our society. And our goal at Widener University with our Common Ground Project is to 
slow things down, to do exactly what Madison was talking about, to, to take the time to listen to each other, to take the time to deliberate, to take the time to find the common passion around an issue, the caring, the commitment, so that we can find common ground. So I think that while our social media may be working against Madisonian values, what we're doing on our campus and what others are doing is actually reinforcing the notion that let's get ahead of the mob, ahead of the, um, the social media, and, and create context, whether it's the uh, panel and breakout groups and conversations we had at the National Constitution Center in November, or the ongoing conversations we're having on our campus around common ground, or our political engagement committee where we um, bring together students with different perspectives. Learn to listen, learn to respect, learn to build bridges, learn to find common ground for the common good. And we're actually training our students to facilitate these conversations as well. So is it too optimistic? It's optimistic, but I think there are ways that we can hold on to that ideal um, of um, taking the time, getting the facts, and, and finding the common ground. Um, and you have a project at the National Constitution Center, the um, Interactive Constitution, that I think also helps to support that goal. And it's one of the things that we're using in our preparation of students as facilitators for common ground discussions and table talks is looking at the interactive constitution. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? That would be great. And as you say, the interactive constitution is very much in the spirit of the Widener Common Ground Initiative of bringing together people of different perspectives for thoughtful deliberation. So here's what the interactive constitution is. And everyone, I want you to download it. Not now because we are talking, but after the panel, you've got to go to the App Store and download the Interactive Constitution or go online to constitutioncenter.org. And this is an amazing online platform that's gotten 16 million hits since it launched just two years ago. And it's co-sponsored by the heads of the leading liberal and conservative lawyers' organizations in America, the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. And these two great groups have nominated the top legal scholars in America to write about every clause of the Constitution with a thousand word statement about what they agree the provision means and then separate thousand word statements about what they disagree. So isn't it exciting to be able to go to the First Amendment, all four uh, clauses, or to the Commerce Clause, or the Export and Port Preference Clause, or the Foreign Emoluments Clause, and see the top scholars agreeing and disagreeing. It is a constitutional feast. I'm a law professor by training, as you can tell, I'm very excited about uh, <laughs> teaching the Constitution. But I learn something every time I choose a clause and click on it, and everyone from Supreme Court justices and judges and their law clerks to students from middle school through high school to the college board, which has adopted this as a centerpiece of the new AP history and government exams and wants to put it at the center of its new middle school curriculum as well, uh, is adopting this online tool. Educators in the audience, I want you to learn from it and work with us as we create version 2.0 of the Interactive Constitution and add videos which will make its content accessible to learners of all backgrounds, links to the leading Supreme Court cases, lessons plans that will help bring it from middle school to high school and beyond, and a provision which I find so exciting that lets you explore the evolving text of each provision, comparing it to the revolutionary era state constitutions, all of which had analogs of the First Amendment, or the 14th Amendment of the various parts of the Constitution, and that close text-based study is great for teaching language arts as well as social studies. So yes, and, and but that's not all. <laughs> I just feel like a Ginsu knife salesman when I talk about this great platform. This partnership between the Constitution Center and the, and the, and the uh, Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society um, is the basis for our America's town hall debates, which are traveling across America and also based in Philadelphia, 
and in cities from Chicago to San Francisco to Dallas, we have liberal and conservative scholars nominated by those legal groups um, debating issues in the news from the Citizens United case to the Second Amendment to should there be term limits for Supreme Court justices. And what's so exciting about these debates is they're uh, not political, they are constitutional. And in each of them, we challenge the audience to ask not what they think good policy is, in other words, not is gun control a good or bad idea, but what does the Second Amendment allow or prohibit? And by asking citizens and students to separate their political from their constitutional views, you can elevate the discussion just in the way the Common Ground Initiative is doing to uh, uh, allow citizens to embrace constitutional results that clash with their policy views. Right. And that, that method of learning to think like a constitutional lawyer, which is the centerpiece of what the Constitution Center is doing, is a very Madisonian project. It's the difference between the momentary passion of what you think the government should do and the reasoned conclusion of what you think the government may do. So that um, effort is deeply important to our educational mission. It's entirely in the spirit of the Common Ground Initiative, which is why I'm so excited by our collaboration. And now, Julie, I want you to tell the audience more about the Common Ground Initiative. How does it work Absolutely. in practice? What kind of discussions are these great students having? Uh, and what is the follow-up then? Absolutely. Um, and I, I just want to say I, I'm excited about what you just said because I think that while we're in this very difficult, divisive, polarized time in our society, and we are challenged in our society and on our campuses. We have fundamental values. We have fundamental principles, and those don't change. And going back to those and those founding documents as a touchstone, I think is very, very important um, for us as colleges and universities, as well as for us as a society. So we started the Common Ground Project because I recognized what was happening on some university campuses, which was um, angry um, and, and sometimes violent debates about what was happening in our country. It was not getting ahead of the issues and people not listening to each other. And we felt we could do something different and frankly better, that we could create a project that was a model for colleges and universities nationally where we got ahead of the issues and spent the time teaching our students and faculty and staff to really listen to each other, bring together people with different perspectives. Now, one thing that social media does that Madison might not have anticipated in social media, but anticipated in our society, is we create filter bubbles, right? We only friend and, and, and get uh, posts from people who agree with us, typically. And we can get rid of the ones we don't like. And most of us do, because they're annoying. We don't like them. So um, what this does is it says, you got to get out of your filter bubble. Common ground means you have to listen. You have to come together in groups. You have to respect other perspectives. You do not have to agree with them, but you have to respect other people's um, right to have those perspectives, and you have to try to understand them. Where are people coming from if they believe something different from you? So what we did was we kicked off this project at the National Constitution Center in a, in a panel discussion that included Jeffrey Rosen, as well as our dean of our law school, Rod Smola, who's a, also a constitutional law expert. Um, and we followed that with table discussions that were facilitated by our students. And we, as I said earlier, we trained our students. We actually had a special class for students who were interested in facilitating, where they looked at the debates that were happening on campus, where they looked at campus free speech policies, where they looked at the interactive constitution, where they looked at um, various documents related to free speech and came up with questions that they thought would be relevant to campuses, but honestly, they're relevant anywhere. And so th the students actually facilitated these difficult conversations about topics that touch on free speech and what's okay, what kind of expression is okay on a 
university campus. Is there a place where you draw the line? How do you listen to people who have different perspectives? We follow that up with uh, focus groups on our campus that we're having every couple weeks where we bring together small groups of people, staff, faculty, students, all in one group to talk about finding common ground. And what's interesting about that is we're bringing together people who would never even talk to each other. They wouldn't even meet each other because you know a campus is big. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of people on our campus, students, faculty, staff, but they're coming together and hearing different perspectives. And it's, it's been a really interesting process of taking the time to listen, to think, to deliberate, and to walk away understanding maybe my perspective isn't the only one. At the same time, we have a tradition of Courage Day on our campus, which focuses on having the courage to speak out about what you believe. One of the issues on college and university campuses is that people say they're afraid to say what they believe. We don't want that to happen. We know we have diversity of perspectives on our campus, and we want to create context where people can share those. Our faculty are working on what they're calling intergroup dialogue so that they um, are ready in their classrooms to deal with difficult issues when they come up instead of turning away from them, which is much more comfortable for them. So we have a lot of initiatives going on on campus, and what we're finding is students are actually learning to listen better to each other. And they're finding that they can respect people who have very different perspectives and try to find that common ground. And some of the things that students have said are, you know, I've learned I really have to listen to people who have different perspectives. I, typically, I would have wanted to shut that off, but I'm learning from that. And that, in fact, as a society, if we hadn't listened over time to different perspectives, we wouldn't have made the progress we made to get to where we are today. And there's you know, many, many, I mean, just think about the, the civil rights movement. That involved listening to perspectives that were not necessarily the majority perspectives. So they recognize that they're learning something from this, and they're going to be prepared to go out into the world as engaged citizens who are able to bring forward our democratic principles, which we think is important. And what this has done for us is, instead of having angry debates on our campus, we're getting ahead of that with thoughtful conversation. So we're, we're pleased with the, with the outcome of that. But one of the questions on campuses is, is there ever a, a time, a place, where it's appropriate to suppress speech, especially hate speech? And it'd be really interesting to hear you um, talk about that, Jeff, because um, you know, we want to everybody wants to protect students um, and, not, and not give them pain, but at the same time, we can't honor the First Amendment without honoring the right to free speech. Well, first of all, that it's just really wonderful to hear about this Common Ground Initiative, and you are modeling exactly the kind of Madisonian conversations that he thought was necessary for the future of democracy. So that's why this is such an important, crucial project. Are there ever limits to free speech, and under what circumstances can it be banned? It is intensely important at the National Constitution Center to teach all Americans why framers from James Madison and Thomas Jefferson to great Supreme Court justices from Louis Brandeis to an overwhelming majority of the current Supreme Court, Republicans and Democrats alike, believe that the Constitution protects what Oliver Wendell Holmes called the thought we hate. And with this great initiative we're doing with the College Board, we're going to put on the interactive Constitution the essential historical cases and Supreme Court cases that led the Supreme Court to that conclusion. So let me, as intensely and quickly as possible, try to convey it, because it's so important that all Americans understand it. And it's so distressing, Julie, as you noted, that in that Brookings survey, a majority of students thought that the First Amendment allowed the banning of hate right. speech, even right. though it does not. Yeah. The National Constitution Center is nonpartisan. We have this great mandate from Congress to uh, inspire uh, active citizenship and increase nonpartisan awareness of under and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. So I can't take sides in these debates, but I can state with total confidence that the First Amendment does protect hate speech. Why? Well, it all goes back to those debates over the sedition laws in 1798 
And then in 1917, when the government is trying to put its critics in jail and ban any speech that brings the government into disrepute. And in 1917, Woodrow Wilson puts in jail Eugene V. Debs, the socialist candidate for president, who runs for president in 1920 from a jail cell because he's been convicted of making a mild speech criticizing World War I. And under the current law of that time, you can be thrown in jail if you make any speech that might have a bad tendency to lead people to disrespect the government or to lead to bad consequences in the future. And the Supreme Court initially upholds those convictions. But in these brilliant dissenting opinions by Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis, the court explains why, according to James Madison, the government can't threaten to imprison its critics unless the speech is intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That is the sentence that I want you all to uh, remember and to teach your students, because that's what Madison said in the Virginia Resolutions, and that's what Brandeis said in his great opinions in the 1920s. In order to, to be suppressed, speech has to be intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Go shoot Jeff now, if one of you said that. It's 9.45 in the morning, so you may be feeling that. <laughs> if it's a joke, then that's fine, although please don't make it. But if it's, in, if it's intended to lead your colleagues to end this panel rather abruptly, mm -hmm. then that can be suppressed and should be. But short of that intentional, uh, credible threat that's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, speech has to be protected. Why? The beautiful... Um, phrases of Brandeis's opinion in Whitney versus California give the best defense for free speech in American history. I can do it as a party trick. This is, here it is. Uh, Brandeis says, those who won our revolution believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary, the kind of deliberation you're trying to promote. They believed uh, in speech both as an end as a means. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. So that's it. If students ask, why does the First Amendment protect hate speech, say, read Brandeis's opinion in Whitney, which is premised on this overwhelming Madisonian belief in public reason, that we have not only the right, but the duty to develop our faculties of reason, and that as long as there's time enough for deliberation, again, that element of time, the best response to hate speech is good speech rather than suppression. Only an emergency justifies suppression, and that's why speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. All right, I, I promised, what, three minutes, and that was too long, <laughs> so maybe we gotta condense it for the interactive constitution. But I think it is, it is urgently important that all Americans understand that historical story about the Sedition Act, that they understand the principles of Whitney, and that they understand that that decision has been reaffirmed by overwhelming majorities of the Supreme Court ever since 1967 when the court upheld the right of a guy standing in a Ku Klux Klan uniform, of all things, at a Klan rally to say hateful things because the faith in public deliberation and the faith that reason was, would prevail was so overwhelmingly important. Now, there's obviously lots and lots of further discussion to be had. And Rod Smala, you're so lucky to have him as the dean of your law school. This, he's one of the uh, most uh, distinguished First Amendment scholars in America. And on our great panel at the Constitution Center, he was giving examples of circumstances under which uh, speech can be regulated uh, uh, in the interests of uh, protecting time, place, and manner restrictions. There are all sorts of hard questions about what university administrators should do when there's actual violence threatened. Generally, you can't have a heckler's veto. If you guys didn't like what we were saying, you're not allowed to stand up and shut us down, even though a majority of, a twin, no, not a majority, but like 30% of students right. in that yeah. Brookings yeah. survey thought that sh shouting down on popular speakers yeah. was, was fine, fine yeah. even though it's unconstitutional if you're a public university. Um, so there are wrinkles, and of course, and then even further, given the intensely contested political climate we're in, the ACLU recently decided not to defend hateful speakers when they're carrying guns, as they were at Charlottesville. 
Um, and there was a debate about that because the right to carry guns is protected in Virginia and the ACLU does protect hate speech, but they worried that if you bring guns to an explosive protest, there's such a likelihood of imminent violence that the Brandeis test might be met. So that's a fair debate to have too. Yeah. But all of this is stuff we can talk about, but broadly you asked me, you know, when can speech be suppressed? And um, uh, well, l let, me, let me ask you uh, this. D uh, was that too wonky? I mean, <laughs> do, do you think it's possible to condense the, that, that lesson quickly? And, and more, and, and just as importantly, when students learn about that kind of history from the interactive constitution and so forth, are they more likely to support the protection? Absolutely, the absolutely. I mean, so much of this is understanding and recognizing that listening to hate speech doesn't mean you agree with it. But people have a right, and remember, Again, going back to major issues like the civil rights movement, the notion of civil rights was considered hate speech. I mean, it was considered offensive speech by many, many people. But you, if we can't make, as our students have said, so they've learned this, well, you can't make progress as a society if you shut down different perspectives. That doesn't mean that you know, the mob can, you know, overcome everything. It, it, you know, you have to listen to their perspectives, you have to think about them, we have to find the common good. But I think that's, that's absolutely true. One of the big challenges, not just on college and university campuses, but also in high schools and even in elementary schools, is, is there a place to say that's not, is, is there a time when it's okay to say that's not appropriate to talk about right now. Um, so we're teaching, for example, a biology class, and students want to talk about politics. Is it okay for the teacher or the professor to say, that's really interesting, but that's not what we're here to talk about in this class? And we believe that it is. We need to do what's appropriate in each classroom. So the classroom is a special place. Um, now, if it's a political science classroom, that's very different because you are going, and this is what happens in our political science classrooms, is people share a lot of different perspectives on an issue and they learn to understand them. But we don't have to let the topic go to something that's inappropriate for the classroom. But at the same time, where the topic is appropriate, it's, it's not okay to shut down an individual's perspective. And this is one of the biggest challenges we're finding with the Common Ground Project is our faculty members saying, um, we want to know how to deal with it when difficult issues, very difficult issues come up in the classroom. So the issue of, um, uh, the right to carry a gun, for example, which is a very threatening issue for many on campus. Many are uncomfortable with that. We are not a public institution, but as I said earlier, I believe in the values and principles that our democracy was founded on. So I think we need to hold to those even though we are a private university. Right. So, um, you know, what do I do as a professor when a difficult topic comes up? How do I handle that? How do we have the conversation? And so that's why we're doing the intergroup, the, uh, intergroup dialogue training and other work on our campus to help people think about how do I respond? How do I not shut down the conversation? Um, but let students know that this is, an, uh, this is okay to have this conversation. And sometimes it may be moving the conversation outside the classroom. So that's a great conversation. This is a biology class, but let's talk about that after class. Or, you know, we have a um, political engagement committee um, event coming up this evening in the student center, and they're actually gonna be talking about that. That's a great place to go and, and share these perspectives. Um, or, or creating spaces for those kind of, kind of conversations, just as our focus groups on common ground create spaces for those kinds of conversations. Everybody wants a simple answer about what can we talk about in the classroom. The answers aren't simple, but, um, and it's interesting because in our common ground conversations on campus, we do have students who have said, I am here to get an education in 
whatever the topic might be, in math or in um, uh, engineering. And I don't want time in my class spent on debating whether or not people should carry a gun on campus. I don't want to spend time doing that. That's not what I'm here for. So how do we create, and, and I think that's a reasonable perspective, and it's interesting for others in the group to listen to that, because we, we do have many in our groups who feel like when a topic comes up, we should address it. We shouldn't shut it down no matter what the, the, um, the topic of the class is. But it's, you know, it's interesting to think about, yes, we do have a responsibility to our students to teach them and to help them learn what they're there for, but not to shut down that conversation as something that it's inappropriate to have or that it's, or to shut down the perspective. It just might not be the right context. And the other thing we're working on is developing sensitivity to how your speech impacts others. So there are power differentials on campuses and schools and our society. Some people feel marginalized. How do we create an awareness among people on our campus and in our society that some people's voice has more power and that if we react to certain speech in a certain way, we can shut down people's perspectives without even intending to. So developing that awareness, that understanding, I think is, is really important. But this is not a simple topic of where it's OK to have these conversations. It's not at all. And all of the great examples you gave have made me want to think aloud with you about what the Madisonian solution to speech at a university is. Because your notion that absolutely certain classrooms can be set aside for biology rather than politics is necessary for promoting reasoned deliberation, also learning about biology. But Madison is really worried that in small communities, mob rule will prevail. Right. He says in Federalist uh, 63, he says, even if every Athenian had been a Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. Because he thinks in small communities where people gossip and exchange information through speech, then uh, the gossip can spread really fast and majoritarian mob passion can prevail and threaten liberty. So that's why he does not want to create the American Republic as a small state. And he thinks that in the extended Republic of America, because communication will be tough, then it'll be harder for mobs and factions to formalize. So all that's different now. We're living in a completely different universe with the web being able to circumvent the communications difficulties. And in universities, which used, I'm just thinking aloud now, but I, Julie, we've got to figure out what Madison would think of yes, know, I, I university. Yes, I want to know. Universities, uh, students used to defer to teachers, and you could say you can say this in the classroom and not outside. But now with the web and Twitter, obviously, people can and should be able to say what they want. And when there's a really controversial speaker, people can get very upset, and mobs can form, and there can be demands to suppress them quickly. So what you're doing is to try to slow down deliberation, to create enclaves of reason so that the mob can't quickly have its way. And what I think I want to now think through with you, and then we'll get audience questions very soon so we can get your insights too, is can we take the insights of the Common Ground Initiative to save American democracy? The question is how to slow down deliberation throughout the country, not just in universities, so that you can have the promotion of reason rather than passion. Part of that's done by the constitutional system of uh, checks and balances and separation of powers and federalism. Madison thinks that by re uh, requiring the different branches to clash with each other and requiring the states and government, uh, federal governments to clash with each other, you'll prevent mob rule from prevailing because it's really hard to get stuff done in America. But as we've seen from Twitter, the idea of representatives directly communicating with their constituents is a Madisonian nightmare. He says in Federalist 10 that the worst thing that you can have is representatives directly being instructed by their constituents, because that leads to mob rule. So tweeting presidents or representatives are a Madisonian uh, evil. 
And the, uh, that's a bipartisan <laughs> statement. It's just, uh, I'm just channeling the great framer uh, based on Federalist 10, where he's, he says that explicitly. So, uh, and once you do have tweeting representatives and presidents, then it's really easy for factions to develop because red state or blue state people will tweet out their positions to their base and the camps will harden and the filter bubbles will calcify and then there's no reason to liberation. So I, I, the Constitution Center has a really exciting project called a Madisonian Constitution for All. What would Madison make of our current presidency, Congress, courts, and media, and how can we resurrect Madisonian values of thoughtful deliberation in America today? It's co-chaired both by the heads of the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, and by Senators Mike Lee and Chris Coons, R's and D's, who really care about the Constitution, and Representatives Zoe Lofgren and Justin Amash, also R's and D's on different sides. The challenge of the commission, their homework, is to analyze this problem and to propose solutions that would resurrect these values of thoughtful Madisonian public reason over time. I don't have the solutions yet, and I can't even offer some teasers uh, to the audience because the commission is just going up and running. But as a, you're, an, I'm now. Uh, if you'll, uh, your assignment, if you accept it, is to be an honorary <laughs> member of this commission. If, but what what insights from the Common Ground Initiative, from your laboratory of democracy at the university level, do you think might be recreated at the state and local and national level to slow down deliberation in American democracy more broadly? Right. Other than turning off social media. That's <laughs> well, that's important. Um, yeah. that's, that's an important I mean, point. You know, I think, um, yeah, I think actually uh, social media breaks might be might be helpful yeah. um, because news travels so fast and sometimes the information that we get isn't as accurate or complete as we might um, as we might hope. Um, so I, I, I really, uh, not surprisingly to everyone here, but I firmly believe in education mm -hmm. as uh, one of the, if not the key solution to this problem. So, and, and not just college and university education, but also K-12 education. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be doing in our classrooms everywhere, all the time, the work that prepares students to be engaged citizens who understand the value of a democracy and how to participate in that democracy. And um, that is a responsibility for everyone who is involved in education. And this is beyond our schools and colleges and universities. It's any environment where we're working with young people. So it may be clubs, it may be activities, it may be um, uh, you know aff affiliation groups, um, but we have a resp it may be religious organizations. We have a responsibility to be teaching young people about civic engagement, about their role as leaders, not necessarily the CEO of a company, not that kind of leader, but a leader who's willing to have the courage to step up and say wait a minute, I don't agree with you. Or do you understand how that makes somebody else feel? Or do you understand the, the implications of what you're saying? Um, we need to develop students who understand that they need to explore the facts behind what they're reading. So information literacy it is increasingly important. Um, I think that this is as important as anything we do in our education system, or we will be fraying the foundations of our democracy, because we are preparing future citizens. And so that, I think, is absolutely key. But this kind of conversation, the, what's happening in the interactive constitution, what's happening through our common ground um, initiative, which I think has huge potential, not only for other colleges and universities, but for schools. And we, we are really looking forward to sharing some of our work with K-12 schools and talking about how they can use it and sharing our, our courage, our work in um, developing courage and our Courage Day initiative with schools as well. I think these things that are happening in colleges and universities and schools can also be happening in all kinds of other organizations in our society. And I think 
We need perhaps to remind, in some cases, our elected leaders, and I think that's what some of our uh, representatives and uh, senators are, are doing, that, wait a minute, we need to come back to these founding principles. We need to think about our commitment to listening, to deliberation, to finding the common good. Um, and we all have that responsibility to do that. I think we also can be really clear ahead of the crisis. And I think that's, I, I think that's important. So what are the guidelines and expectations in a school, on a campus, in an organization, in any industry, in any business? What are the guidelines and expectations ahead of something happening? So I'll just take a simple example that's happened on a lot of college and university campuses as well as in our larger society taking a knee at a football game. It's an example of free expression. And yet, there are many who have said, you should not be allowed to do that, um, and have actually tried to suppress that. So my, I felt my job as a university president is to say, not only do I support our athletes taking a knee if they choose to do that, I'm not telling them to do it, I'm not telling them not to do it, but they will be supported as an aspect of free expression, but also to tell our coaches, to tell the people who are working with our students, that we support this as a university. We support free expression as a university so that we don't get to the place. So we've done the deliberation ahead of time. We've mm. talked about the issue. We've said why we're, we think what we think. We've said that we're gonna support free expression so that we don't get to the place where we have people saying, at the last minute, without deliberation, out of fear, out of worry, you can't express yourself in this way or that way. Um, that is a wonderful defense of the necessity, the urgent necessity of civic education as crucial to the success of a university in American democracy. And don't you see, uh, uh, friends, the, um, civic education is not some mushy kumbaya, let's all just, you know, uh, feel good Nothing. enterprise. The whole system collapses without it, as Julie has just said. And that's what Madison believed. He, he did not believe that constitutional and civic education was just some optional uh, thing that was uh, uh, um, desired. He thought that unless citizens learned how to deliberate thoughtfully, to listen to each other, to adhere and love the principles of the Bill of Rights, not because judges told them they had to, but because they understood them and internalized them and could uh, explain uh, why it was necessary to respect minority rights, then the system would collapse. So that is why you, that's such a beautiful example of educating coaches about how to instantiate First Amendment principles before the controversy happens. It's why Education, as you said, absolutely at the K through 12 level and at the university level is crucial to creating the kind of citizens Madison thought were necessary. And remember, Madison is um, not, uh, uh, he's kind of radical here. John Adams thinks that just the separation of powers will protect liberty. Alexander Hamilton, the rap star of the moment, is such a monarchist <laughs> that he wants a president for life who's strong enough to resist mob rule and believes that a really strong National Congress will spare the people the need to deliberate. Madison is different. He thinks majorities do always have to rule, but it's only rightful, thoughtful majorities that respect minority rights that will allow the system to survive. And that's why he believed that education was so important, and that's why the Common Ground Initiative is a necessary model of democracy, and that's why the National Constitution Center is urgently important. It is important that there be one place in America where both sides, uh, ours and D's and everyone in between feel empowered to come together to debate the most intensely contentious issues in American society. Confident that those debates will be civil, they will be constitutional rather than political, people will listen respectfully to both sides, and then citizens will make up their own mind. And they'll develop the humility that recognizes that the Constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing points of view, as Justice Holmes said. There are not easy answers to most of these constitutional questions. Uh, you know, you may think that these policy questions have obvious answers, the ones that are before our country, that, that, that people are fighting about. Uh, others will disagree with you, but does the, first, does the Second Amendment allow the regulation of 
uh, weapons and under what circumstances. Um, you know, the Supreme Court has good arguments on both sides of that question. Under what circumstances can campaign uh, finance speech be suppressed? You gotta read the majority as well as the dissent. And understanding to uh, respect the integrity of the arguments on both sides allows citizens to deepen their knowledge so that they can make informed decisions and make up their own minds. So that's why our collaboration is important. That's why we're both excited to be here at South by Southwest to try to be evangelists for public reason, if I can, I just, just said that that's I like it, word. new title. <laughs> I don't know, Madison <laughs> talked about an empire of reason, and we're not imperialists, but maybe we can be evangelists for reason. And that's why we want to uh, invite all of you to join us in our uh, crusade. Should we, should we take some Absolutely. questions? Absolutely, yeah. we'd like you to come up to the microphone right here, line up at the microphone if you have questions. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, so right now I'm an independent higher education consultant, but back when I first started my career, um, I worked in student affairs. So I'm asking this question from a perspective of someone that's worked in student affairs and has also studied college student development theory. So I'm wondering how you balance um, free speech and civil dialogue on campus with teaching students to spot what I'll call fake speech, if you will, right? People saying information as though it's true. Um, and also how for them to form what they believe, to decide what they believe based on all of the information, all the different points of views that they're hearing. I, I'm particularly interested how you do that at your university, but if you have thoughts on that, that would be great also. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll start. You may have some thoughts about that as well, Jeff. Um, the fact that you um, listen to something or, or hear something that um, isn't accurate doesn't mean you have to agree with it. So we're not, and I think it's important to make the distinction that we're not saying you need to listen and say, oh yeah, that's right. So, you know, we, we're, at, and it's very easy to call something you don't agree with fake, right? So I think I would err on the side of saying it's important to listen to try to understand and then make your own judgment. The First Amendment doesn't require that you agree. In fact, it, the, what Madison was saying was you need to make your own judgment about what you're hearing. Um, but it's important to listen. Now, in terms of distinguishing between what's real and fake, what's accurate and inaccurate, I, I prefer accurate and inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but. Um, you know, that's something that we have an enormous responsibility to do with our students, no matter what age they are, from the time they're in preschool, really. Um, how do you, you know, what do we do to figure out if something is accurate? Can you trust everything you see online? Can you trust everything you hear on the radio or television? Can you trust everything you hear from your friends? No, our job as citizens is to question and to, ex to explore and to find out. That's part of what being an engaged citizen is. And it is absolutely imperative at this time when social media and inaccurate information is so pervasive that we focus on teaching students to look deeper, explore farther, don't assume that what you see is, um, is accurate. Um, but don't assume that if you don't agree, it's inaccurate. I think that's a wonderful way of putting it, teaching that habit of skeptical uh, reasoning, which uh, examines the sources of news to make a decision about whether it's accurate or inaccurate, while at the same time not abandoning the enlightenment faith that there's a difference between truth and falsehood. The whole system collapses if citizens can't agree on facts. Because the whole, remember those beautiful Brandeis words? Citizens have a developing to cultivate their faculty of reason. That comes from Thomas Jefferson, who thinks we all have certain faculties ranging from reason at the bottom to passion reason at the top to passion at the bottom, and unless we can cultivate reason rather than passion, then we cannot be full citizens. So it's crucially important that we maintain that there is a difference between fact and fiction, between accurate and inaccurate information, while at the same time 
helping students develop the tools of critical evaluation that will allow them to make up their own minds about what's accurate and inaccurate. Madison, again, says you have to have complete protection for freedom of conscience. It's the central, unalienable, natural right that comes from God or nature rather than government. The freedom to make your own decisions about what is fact and what is falsehood based on external sensations operating on your reason is inherent in all of us as creatures of reason. So we need to speak this language. I think we need to speak the language of reason. We have to insist that there is a difference between fact and falsehood, but not put government or administrators in the business of telling students what is fact and what is fiction. That is their obligation as creatures, uh, of, as, 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 as reasoning Thank individuals. I do want to say that your passion about the Constitution does not mean that it doesn't come from reason. <laughs> you can have a because passion for a reason, yes, yeah, absolutely. Right. There's no question about yeah. that, and for education. <laughs> Thanks for that. Great, thank you so much for this really timely session. My question is this, you mentioned that it's important to have a touchstone with founding principles, and of course the Constitution is one, but as you recognize at universities and colleges across the country, we have missions and founding principles around respect, inclusion, diversity. And so I, my question is this, one for you, Julie, as a president of a university, to what extent through the Common Ground Project or otherwise, are you working with your equity office or how are they a partner to ensure, because we have an obligation, right, to have a non-discriminatory environment, one that's free of discrimination and harassment, both in our education environment for our students, but also for our faculty and staff. And of course, the Office for Civil Rights says, you know, you have the, they aren't asking that we do anything that that is counter to the First Amendment, but kind of how is that tension about keeping that non-discriminatory environment, so it's not physical safety, it's not an, necessarily an uh, imminent threat of physical violence, although we have that too, and in transparency, I'm, I'm at UVA, so oh, you know, well. where the tension is, is very much there, but yes. then for you, Jeff, as well, to what extent are the resources that you have or your institution and center sort of speaking to that, that kind of issue around Title VI, Title IX, ADA, and, and the intersections there? Thank you. So um, that's a great question. And so one of the things that we've done is make sure that our chief diversity officer is central to this project and to all of our conversations. Um, and in fact, um, is present at all of our focus group um, conversations. We also have faculty leadership uh, that um, focuses on diversity and inclusion and have made sure that those faculty leaders are part of these conversations. Um, we, it is, this is where it gets tricky, is to draw the line between, or maybe it's not a line, but people feeling harassed by hearing perspectives that they don't agree with. And that's why I think our approach is actually really a, a thoughtful approach. It is to get ahead of that to have these conversations before people feel harassed or before they're offended by something that somebody says, to, say, to actually put out there transparently, we want, here's why it's important to listen to other people, but here's why it's also your responsibility to understand how you impact other people when you say what you have to say. So I spoke earlier about understanding your power, understanding um, your, um, authority in the environment, understanding how your speech may impact someone else. That's something we have to teach our students as well. Because in the workplace, when they leave us, they need to understand how what they say is going to impact someone else. And, the, and you know, so a lot of this is about ethics and integrity in what you do, um, and taking the initiative when it's appropriate to speak out Sometimes it is speaking out to say, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I also think that's really offensive to someone else. That's what we're trying to teach our students, and we're trying to do it in a proactive way. And we have a leadership institute on campus. We actually give a leadership certificate and a leadership minor um, that any student can earn. And those are actually the, the, um, the outcomes that we seek. It's integrity, initiative, collaboration, and decision making. That's what we're trying to develop. And we see that as very much connected to this effort. 
It's great to learn about those important efforts. And thank you for a great question and for identifying uh, an important uh, tension in some cases, which, where, as Julie said, people can uh, feel harassed, and that can lead to calls for the suppression of speech. The Constitution Center talks about all parts of the Constitution, and in it, we have a great Equality for All initiative, which wants to teach citizens about the post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution, the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, what its original understanding was and how it plays out in cases today, and teaching people about how the promise that Lincoln made at, at Gettysburg was enshrined in the Constitution after the Civil War, was thwarted by the Supreme Court for a century, and finally resurrected during the Civil Rights Movement, and has continued to be played out today. But uh, you've identified attention, and we've also sponsored debates. Should the First Amendment be amended to allow the banning of hate speech in the name of dignity? And there are some scholars who make powerful arguments that it should be. We had a great debate in Dallas where Shannon Gilreath of Wake Forest said, dignity and diversity and inclusion are themselves constitutional rights, and when speech threatens those rights and makes people and threatens their dignity, then it should be allowed to be suppressed. And that's what the Europeans do. In Europe, it is, hate speech is illegal and it can be banned on dignitary grounds. And Gilreath said the Supreme Court is wrong and should change its interpretation of the First Amendment. That's a very valid constitutional debate. If many students agree with that, as a descriptive matter, I predict that in 30 years, a future court might change its understanding and we have to debate all issues. But we do, do it in a respectful, constitutional way, weigh the competing values, and let people make up their own minds. And I think also, it, just to f say one last thing about this question, we can condemn hatred and bigotry as campus leaders, as teachers, as professors, um, without necessarily stopping the speech. And I think we do have a responsibility to do that. Hi, um, I'm a high school journalism educator and I run a student network called Global Student Square. Um, I have two questions, one for Julie. Um, I'm wondering if you have any kind of a toolkit or a playbook or something that people can take away and um, use to train their own people, sort of train the trainers to have those table talks you mentioned. Um, and then for Jeff, um, two cases we teach in scholastic journalism are the Tinker v. Des Moines and Hazelwood v. Kohlmeyer cases. And I'm just kind of wondering, I, I'm sure that um, you know very well the tension between those two cases. And I'm wondering if you could make some quick comments about um, uh, how, how those cases might factor into this discussion. Um, some of what Julie mentioned in terms of like telling the coach ahead of time that a knee might be dropped and how to handle it. Um, we get very nervous as student journalists, um, yeah. journalism teachers about prior restraint um, and uh, prior review. And so I'm wondering if you could address that a little bit. So the first, I can answer the first one really quickly. We don't have the toolkit yet, but we're working on it and we want to share it with high schools. <laughs> um, and thanks for identifying the tension between the Tinker case, which says that the black armband protesting the Vietnam War is permissible because students do have free speech rights, and Hazelwood, which suggests that certain uh, criticisms of uh, administrators may be banned when they're disruptive to school um, uh, discipline, and that uh, students at school may have uh, fewer rights when the speech is on campus or in an online environment that's directed to be on campus and foreseeably might be disrupted. Uh, it's obviously a great teaching tool to outline both principles and uh, ask students what they think, because students care a lot of, properly about their own free speech rights. That may be a great way to teach the First Amendment itself. And the Supreme Court is really divided on this question in the recent uh, Bong Hits for Jesus case, the well-named mm -hmm. well Bong Hits for Jesus case, mm -hmm. where the student said he was joking, but the school disciplined him for his silly banner. The majority of the court said, yes, that's fine, because students have fewer rights when their speech foreseeably affects school discipline. The dissenter said he was joking. And Justice Thomas, citing the original understanding of the First Amendment, says students have no free speech rights at all. So just laying out the three positions is really helpful, and then ask students what they think. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I would add that the bong hits for Jesus case is interesting because the speech occurred not on school grounds, but across from school grounds. Um, 
So it's just an interesting, I think those are two really interesting cases, not only to student journalists, but to any student at school, and I am kind of hoping that they're part of the AP curriculum you're developing. It would, I'd love it would, to know more about that. It would be great, and, and, and finally, as you say on that point, the net completely obscures and complicates the distinction between what's on campus and what's off campus, and there are all sorts of lower court cases from kids who are using school networks from their home mobile devices to send emails, and is that on or off campus? A, a spatial conception makes no sense nowadays, so the court has to rethink it. It's just begun to do that. Encouraging students to come up with a new First Amendment line in the age of the internet would be helpful, because the court needs it. And I really believe these are hard questions. Citizens have to figure them out. Justices have to figure them out. Let's treat students with enough respect to give them the arguments on both sides and give them the homework assignment. Where, If you were crafting the First Amendment principle for free speech in school online, where would it be? It would be great. So we have two more questions. We're out of time, but I think we can answer these two quickly. <laughs> All right, hi, thank you. Uh, so I teach US history and AP US history. Um, and whenever I get to sort of that critical period, I gotta slow down because if they don't understand the Constitution, they're not gonna understand the rest of history. So I just wanna say thank you for creating these sort of programs that enable me as, my, as a teacher to do that better. Um, along those same lines with sort of accessibility, so I didn't follow your rules and looked at the app while you were talking. That's okay. <laughs> um, and it looks great, but I'm just curious, maybe not in you know Interactive Constitution 2.0, but maybe 3.0, is there the possibility that you could make it sort of um, sort of vertical in a way where you can change the lexile, you can alter things so that, you know, by the time they get to me in 11th grade, they can read what you provided, but you can go even lower um, and sort of make it more accessible so that they're learning it even earlier. Interesting. Th thank you for that. And the answer is, uh, I, I, I hope the answer will be yes. Uh, I completely understand the fact that the interactive constitution, although uh, th th thrilling is wonky, and it's good for AP kids, but maybe not for uh, middle school kids. Even version 2.0 through its videos will hope to make it more accessible, and then we hope through future instantiations to make it grade appropriate, lexically appropriate, and accessible to all Yeah, I just know students. with things like Newzella around that it, it, it's easy to sort of change that and sort of, you know, sort of differentiate for your, your audience. You, Newzella, tell me, what is Newzella? Newzella, so oh, yeah. it's a, it's a, um, they're here, they've been here, I've met some people from here, from there, but they take current events and they write articles that you can sort of have a drop down menu and click on where are the students in terms of grade level reading, if they're or English mm -hmm. learners, where are they in sort of being ready to be reclassified to you know, sort of proficient, and you change that and it's the same content but just at a different lexile so it's more um, understandable for mm -hmm. them. Fascinating, thanks for that, yeah, yeah, that's really great. Yeah, yeah that's good to know that, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm a high school classmate of Justin Amash's, and I follow him on Twitter, so oh. I really should talk to him. About that. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so Great. I, um, my question is a little bit outside of the scope of this conversation, which is about higher ed and free speech and within higher ed. Um, but you seem to be coming from a premise that education is part of the answer to solving our civil discourse. In Dana Boyd's keynote yesterday, she mentioned that a growing number, or it seems like a growing number of Americans are skeptical of education, and they, in some ways, want nothing to do with it. So what do we do about those people? How do we bring them into the fold? How do we continue that conversation with them? So, I mean, one of the reasons that people are skeptical is because they don't think we're having these converse, kinds of conversations. Um, they, they think a lot of the skepticism about higher education comes from a sense that higher education is so skewed towards one perspective that um, there's not room to hear other perspectives. There's not a, a, a learning to listen to other perspectives. So we need to get the word out that that's not what we're doing. I mean, I think the, the, the biggest issue for higher education is we don't communicate very well about what we do and about the outcomes. So um, is it worth it? Is there a return on investment? Um, that's really what we need to do as higher education. To, to, we need to educate the public about what we do and the value of what we do and, and what the outcomes are. That's great. Um, I'll just use this to uh, wrap up. We absolutely have to teach people about efforts like Julie's to 
bring together people of different perspectives uh, so that uh, citizens can educate themselves. But I want to end by saying, skeptical of education, citizens have to understand they have a duty to educate themselves. This is not just an option. They have a responsibility as citizens to take the time to develop their faculties of reason, to dig in deeply to matters of public concern so that they can be governed by reason rather than passion. As educators, we have a responsibility to tell the thrilling stories of uh, history and literature that will inspire education uh, and develop the habits of lifelong learning. But ultimately, this is a responsibility that each citizen has uh, for him or herself. Mm -hmm. and, and there is no higher calling as a citizen than education. It is a lifelong effort. It never stops. That's why we are all in the business of lifelong education. And Julie and I are so happy to have come to South by Southwest to share our projects with you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all. Thank you.